Good morning, everybody. This is Archana here from the Read, Write, Inspire Classics Book Club. Last month in our Classics Book Club, we read Anthony Doerr's All the Light We Cannot See. Today, I thought it might be helpful to do a sh short, quick, and insightful video about this modern classic. All the Light We Cannot See is a historical novel set in occupied France during World War II. It won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the 2015 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. This video has some spoilers, so if you haven't read this beautifully written literary masterpiece, click save. You can find that below and save this to your watch later list. Read the book first and come back here. And while you are doing that, it would be an enormous favor if you would subscribe to this channel too. Coming back to the book. Mary Laure lives in Paris near the Museum of Natural History, where her father works as a locksmith a lock maker. Mary is visually challenged. When she is 12, the Nazis occupy Paris and father and daughter flee to the walled citadel of Saint Malo, a seashore city where Mary Lors, reclusive great uncle lives in a very tall house by the sea. With them, they carry what might be the museum's most valuable, most precious gem called the Sea of Flames. The other parallel story that we follow is of an orphan boy, Werner, who lives with his younger sister in an orphanage in a, a mining town in Germany. Uh, both of them are science nerds and they are uh, enchanted by a radio which brings them news and stories uh, from places they have never seen or imagined. Werner becomes an expert at building and fixing radios and because of that he is enlisted to use his talent to track down the resistance movement by the Nazis. The lives of Mary and Werner intervene and uh, in unimaginable ways towards the end of this book. Um, it really makes you wonder how unfair war is, how it shatters the lives of people caught in it without choice, and uh, how humanity wins despite all of this. Anthony Doerr, the author of the book, pursued his MFA at Bowling Green State University, Ohio. He was uh, popular for his short stories in his university days itself. And um, in fact, he is the recipient of multiple awards for his literary contributions. He has won uh, O. Henry Prize four times. It is the most prestigious award given uh, for short fiction in US. He also won the Sunday Times uh, Short Story Award, which carried with it an enormous cash prize of about 30,000 pounds. As we have already seen, he has also won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for All the Light We Cannot See. The book spent about 130 consecutive weeks on the New York Times bestseller list um, for hardcover fiction. It was also the biggest selling title in the history of its UK publisher, Fourth Estate. Uh, let's talk about some of the interesting historical references in this book. So uh, there's a lot about Napolas or the National Political Institutes of Education, uh, which were established there. These are boarding schools for secondary students introduced by the Nazis. They were modeled on English public schools such as Eton and Harrow. One surprising thing was that 
many student and teacher exchange programs took place between British public schools and these Napolas. Before all this, of course, all this happened before the war broke out. In 1942, there were 33 Napola schools, out of which three were for girls. The conditions to be a part of this institution was that one must be racially flawless, they must have no poor hearing or vision, they must have above average intelligence, also, they had a series of eight-day entrance exams which they had to clear to be eligible to enter the, uh, this Napola school. So the Napolas were highly competitive and brutal just as they are shown in this book. About one-fifth of the cadets failed to meet the requirement uh, the required standards and they were sent home because of injuries sustained in training accidents. The students were used in the war, in the later stages of the war. They were poorly trained and equipped, but uh, these students were highly motivated. Another interesting issue highlighted in the book is the Nazi plundering of France is artworks and artifacts. Adolf Hitler was an unsuccessful artist who was denied admission to the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. But he considered himself as a connoisseur of the arts in uh, Mein Kampf, his uh, autobiography. He ferociously attacked modern art like Cubism and Futurism as degenerate. He favoured classical portraits and landscapes by the old masters, particularly those of German origin. Once Hitler came to power, he confiscated nearly 16,000 paintings and sculptures from German museums. About 1,004 paintings and sculptures and 3,824 watercolour drawings, prints, etc. were burnt in public. This reminded me of the book burnings uh, that we've read and, uh, before and it made me wonder, what is this between tyrants and creativity? They seem to be so scared of creative works that nothing short of burning them works for them. So some of these artworks were also sold in an art exhibition which was called as the Degenerate Art Exhibition. Of course, not many people turned up to buy anything from there and most of these artworks were shipped abroad. Now, most of them which were shipped abroad actually completely disappeared and they have been untraceable even till today. The Nazis, when they occupied France, they were bound by treaties that said that they cannot take any artworks out of the country. So they circumvented this by looting the art of only the Jewish collectors in France. They said that those who had left France just before the war were no longer French citizens and their property could be seized. Thus began this great visit of the Nazis visiting bank worlds and empty residences of these French citizens and they collected the works of art there. The pieces left behind in 15 largest Jewish owned art galleries in Paris were also collected and uh, transported in French police vans between 1940 and 42, Goring, one of the most powerful leaders of the Nazi party, traveled 20 times to Paris. The art dealer Bruno Lossi staged 20 expositions of the newly looted art objects, especially for Goring, during these visits. From this, 
Goring selected at least 594 pieces for his own collection. He is known to have boasted openly that he owned the largest private art collection in Europe. So what did France do to protect itself from the Nazi plunder? As soon as it became evident that France would be occupied, the Lorraine Museum was closed for three days, officially claiming that it was closed for repairs. Much of the art collections there was hauled on trucks. About nearly 203 vehicles transported 1,862 wooden cases and they were sent to the Chateau du Chambeau. Crete's had color markings to show the importance of the artwork that, they, that was inside. So red meant that there was a globally important art piece inside. The Mona Lisa was marked with three red circles. The art pieces were clandestinely moved from Chateau to Chateau. For example, the Mona Lisa was moved from the Chambeau to several castles and abbeys to finish at the Musée Ingres in Montabo. Please forgive all my pronunciations. I am doing the best that I can. Scientific references are also another interesting aspect to this book. Doer has sprinkled scientific references all around the book. Did you know, he also writes a column on science books for the Boston Globe. Interesting. I read an interview where Doer states, rather than write what I know, I write what I want to know. In the process, he also enlightens us about a lot of scientific phenomena. I read an interesting quote by Doer where he shares his thoughts about the intersection of literature and science. Science composes a whole host of ways to investigate the world, to probe mysteries, and the best scientists are comfortable working with uncertainty. Operating in the unknown, this seems to me very similar to what fiction writers do. We find a thing, a person, a place, a feeling that we are vitally interested in and we pursue that interest through language. So I don't see science and literature as separable entities, buildings that should be built on opposite sides of a street opposite sides of a college campus. I see them both as useful, even vital ways to try to understand what we are doing here in the frighteningly brief time we have. For me, the natural world is not something separate from the human world. The outside is not something we shuttle ourselves out into for an are a day before hurrying back indoors to our hand sanitizers and indoor plumbing. We are the natural world and it is us. In case you wondered why the author named this book All the Light You Cannot See, he explains that by saying that it is a reference to all the light we literally cannot see. That is, the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Metaphorical suggestion that there are countless invisible stories still buried within the Second World War. We spent too much time focused on only a small slice of the spectrum of possibility. That was also another thing that the author wants to say by using this book. 
The author shares an amusing incident when he was in the New York subway. And this is what gave him the idea for this book. He came across this person who was angry at his phone because it refused to pick up a signal 80 feet beneath the ground. And he was pounding on the phone keys in frustration. Dor felt sad that this person did not realize that he was holding such a fantastic piece of equipment in his hand, which could transmit messages, voice and video so far away. That was when he got the idea for all the light we cannot see. This book is beautifully written in a non-linear style with 200 little pocket chapters. Dor says he chose to make these little chapters because it gave him a chance to make small, manageable miniatures that he could refine over months, then string together into strands to tell a story. For the reader, suspending one narrative for a few pages and returning to the other creates suspense and uh, momentum. It also allows the reader to take a breath. You know, when you take a breath, when you see some white space and you're able to let down for a moment. And I think that adds a lot of impact to the book. One beautiful aspect to the book is how humans as a species search for little joys in their life. Despite however desperate and despicable things might be around them. For instance, Madame Manique takes Marie Law out to the ocean after her father's disappearance. The ocean does so much to calm her, to help her recover from her sorrow. Frederick listens to bird songs and enjoys identifying the bird species based on what he hears. And he does this despite all the physical and emotional beating that he faces in the hands of his classmates and also his teachers. Mary's father builds models to perfection. Did he do it just for Mary? Or does it give him joy too? Paul Kamer of the Hitler Youth Camp has a fondness for music. It's so surprising there's this big Hulk who loves music. At the end of the novel, he risks bombing the place and even losing his life for the sake of freedom only after listening to the music played by Mary. Etienne, who was so scared to even send important messages on the radio, ends up actually playing music on the radio for everyone to enjoy just for the joy of it. Life is beautiful. People are good. That's reality. And that's what you would feel in your heart when you close the last page of this book. All that I shared with you here, along with many more insights, was initially discussed as a group over a Zoom call in the Read, Write, Inspire Classics Book Club. If you would like to be a part of this book club, it, remember, it's completely free to join in. We would love to have you there. I will leave a link to it in the description box below. Do check it out. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.